Welcome back to another episode of World Bigfoot Radio. Howdy, everybody. Welcome back, back to, to the, the show. show. And tonight, tonight I got a first-time first time guest, guest, a special, special guest, guest onto on. the show, and someone that you would not usually expect to see on World Bigfoot Radio. And he is a big, prominent name in the ufology community. And I am, of course, referencing my guest. You can see him on the screen right there, Richard Doty. Welcome to World Bigfoot Radio. Dukes, it's my privilege to be here. Uh, <laughs> I've always had a, some interest in the subject. And um, I'm going to learn some more tonight, and and uh, I think you're going to enjoy what I have to uh, uh, tell as far as the stories, the two stories that I have for you regarding Bigfoot. Awesome. I'm sure everybody will be fascinated to hear that. And so, first of all, before we get started, for the benefit of the people in the Bigfoot community that don't really know that much about you, can give us some background? Well, my name is Richard Doty. I'm a uh, former a uh, U.S. Air Force intelligence officer. I worked for the Air Force Office of Special Investigations for 10 years, from 1978 to 1988. Uh, I investigated UFO sightings, UFO incidents. I am prominently mentioned uh, within the UFO community as being a, a disinformation officer, but in actuality, uh, we call it counterintelligence operations. Uh, one of the the biggest investigation probably I did uh, was inside Area 51. Um, I do have a show on Gaia, and uh, I, I, um, I tell the incidents and stories about what I did within the uh, U.S. Uh, intelligence service during my time there. But I am a real Rick Doty. There's a lot of wannabes out there who claim to be, but I'm the real, I'm the real one. <laughs> Cue Slim Shady music. <laughs> and so, uh, but I've, I've, uh, I think there's actually uh, some kind of connections between the two. There's so many different stories out there within the UFO community that relates to hairy monsters, 
uh, right after a sighting of a of a UFO or a flying saucer landing at a certain location. And uh, that I'll leave that from another for another another time because there's there's many different stories. But I am the real one, and uh, I'm here tonight to talk about uh, a couple stories that I know. Uh, one next actual experienced, and another one about a about the Patterson Gimlin film. Right on. Well, let's go uh, immediately to your experience because I've already gotten the uh, brief version of it. I know you've mentioned it before, but feel free to go into as much depth as you care to. Okay, uh, <clears throat> my brother and I uh, hike. We, I, I live in New Mexico. He does too, but we hike in Colorado. Uh, we hike all over Colorado. Um, our families go up in an RV, they drop us off, and we hike for three to five days in the mountains of Colorado, uh, around Pagosa Springs, Creed, South Fork, um, Gunnison, Almont, that, that area. The story I'm going to tell tonight happened in June of 1999. My brother and I were camping up near a place called Mirror Lake. And Mirror Lake is, uh, is extremely high up in altitude, uh, almost near the tree line, um, west or east of Taylor Reservoir, and a little bit east of a, a little small community called Tin Cup. It's a lake that um, probably the average temperature is about 50 degrees. Oh. We, li we, <laughs> we like to hike up there and we like to fish because there's there's so so many uh, uh, there's so many trout, uh, right. especially German brown trout, uh, in that lake. On this particular day, we we hiked up early in the morning from our campsite, which is maybe a half a mile away. And in order to get to the right uh, fishing area on Mirror Lake, uh, we like to hike over to the north side. But you can't walk a, along the uh, shoreline because there's it's too steep and there's very, very little shoreline. So you have to climb up a lot embankment, a small hill, and then transfer that over to another location farther to the east and then down, down to the lake uh, shore to fish. So that day we fished uh, till about four o'clock in the afternoon. We caught our limit and we were getting ready to go back. So we had to hike back up the embankment which is probably 300 meters. We got to the top and you can just walk along the top of that embankment down to where our campsite was. But as we got up to the top, my brother instantly turned to me and put his hand over his mouth. And, you know, I've been in the military and he was a special forces uh, officer. So uh, he was given hand signals. I knew what he was yeah. talking about. You know what that then, means. Yeah, and he, he and he and he he did this thing and pointed down. As I looked down, uh, again, probably three hundred, maybe uh, hundred to fifty to two hundred yards down, there's a, a creek that ra runs on the bottom of this embankment. It's called Willow Creek. And we fished down there before, uh, a fly fish. And as I looked down there, there's this hairy creature, a rather big hairy creature. Uh, kneeling down along the creek, his back was to us, and he was washing something. It was washing something. Well, when I saw it, of course, what flashed in my mind was, my God, that's a Sasquatch or a Bigfoot or a Yeti. <laughs> and I didn't say anything. I'm looking at my brother, and he's looking at me, and he's he's saying, get your camera out. So I'm trying trying to find my camera and apparently the commotion it, it stood up now from where we were at it looked like 12 feet tall from where we were at but as we when we went down there to investigate this we compared its height to a tree adjacent to it and uh i i'd say it was at least six five to six ten foot Mm -hmm. So anyways, and when I was trying to find my camera, it stood up and turned around and looked at us. And it didn't seem to be afraid. It just stood there and it had something in its hands. Uh, my brother thought it was a rabbit, but I think it was some kind of a, a vegetable or, or, or some some vegetation. Mm -hmm. 
It, it, that's what it looked like to me. And it just, it, it probably for 10 seconds, we stared at it and it stared at us. I didn't seem to be uh, scared. Uh, my brother certainly wasn't. And as, as my brother turned to me, and he said, let's go. Well, I looked at him like, are you kidding me? <laughs> now, now we did, we were armed. We mm -hmm. both had uh, sidearms and I always take sidearms out there. Anyways, so we walked down there and it is quite a steep uh, uh, climb down. And of course, by the time we got down here, it had, it had, it had crossed the creek. But we stood around uh, and, and looked at where it had knelt. And although it didn't have, we couldn't find any uh, actual uh, footprints until we got towards the actual shoreline. It was part of the foot was in the mud and part of it was uh, in the water. We did see big, huge prints of its knees. So we realized at that point it was kneeling down. Uh -huh. And the knee and, and the prints were about that far apart, the knee, knee prints. Uh -huh. So um, we went across the creek trying to find it, trying to tra track it. Um, we, we probably tracked it for probably 30, 35 minutes, but we came up to this rock uh, face wall and you know, we could have went one way or the other. Couldn't we? Couldn't have climbed it, and we decided at that point, um, just you know, we lost it. So we went back and and, and we made it back to the uh, campsite, and we talked about it. And and <clears throat> ironically, about um, about eight o'clock at night, and we were out cooking a meal. Uh, a a ranger came up, uh, uh, U.S. A Forest Service enforcement officer. And uh, he he came over. He checked our our pass, uh, our uh, camping pass, and he asked if if we'd caught any fish. And I said, you know, we're eating them. <laughs> yeah, we did. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he said, uh, okay. I said, hey, can can I ask you a question? He said, sure. I said, have you worked this area for a long time? And he said, yeah, I've worked in the. And it's a it's a uh, the area that we're at was a Rocky Mountain National Forest area. Mm -hmm. He said, I've been, I've been here about 10, 12 years. I said, did you ever uh, hear any stories about Bigfoot? Oh, yeah, all the time. I said, have you ever seen them? He said, no. He said, I've seen where they lived. Well, I I I was a novice and my brother was, too. We we had no idea what he was talking about. I said, you mean it has uh, places to live? He said, yeah, they tear down these trees and they put them in like an ig like like <clears throat> almost like an in Indian tents, how like a teepee, Indian tent would set up a teepee would would be made out of. And it would live under it. Mm. Wow. Well, you know, I but I remember seeing some of them during our forays in the forest. I said, well, I think we saw one this afternoon. He said, oh, down by Willow Creek. And my brother and I looked and then my brother took over talking. and he said, you mean, you know, you know, he said, uh, there's been a lot of sightings down there that of this huge seven foot, two inches tall. Now, he, that's what he said. Maybe it was we compared it to this tree and we'd say maybe six, ten, but but nobody's ever taken a picture. We've got some footprints and it could just be a bear. Yeah. And that was our, that was the ending of our conversation there. And so. We we turned there uh, not not 1980 but 1981 we went back up there, and of course for the sole purpose. Now we had all our camera gear in line. Now, <laughs> we were ready. I had a brand Your new artist. AE1, a, yeah. a Canon AE1 camera, and I and I thought we're going to get pictures of this thing. So our sole purpose going, we didn't do any fishing. Was when we got across, we hiked down, and probably for five or six hours. We searched and searched and searched and searched and never saw a thing. So that's my story. Um, it's a, it was an incredible sighting. Um, I've told this to other people. Uh, Eric, my very, very good friend, uh, Jensen, and uh, another uh, uh, kind of an amateur research, uh, Bigfoot researcher in New Mexico, uh, Les Gaines. And, uh, you know, he asked me a lot of questions about, you know, the facial features, how long the arms were, things that 
I wouldn't have thought of asking. Uh, the arms are definitely longer than a human's arms. It certainly wasn't a human in disguise. Why? Why would out in the middle of nowhere be a? Because that was also presented to me. Exactly. Even guys, if they're I, even if they're pranking you, you can tell by body proportion. There's several dead giveaways that it's not a human in a suit. And one thing is, like you said, the length of the arms, and that's mostly in the forearms. Their forearms are longer than ours are. So they reach down close to the, where their knees are, sometimes even lower. And then the same thing with their legs. Their shins are shorter than ours are, and their thighs are longer. So that you can't take a human and put them in a Bigfoot suit and make the proportion look right. We're not built that way. I agree. I agree 100% because this definitely wasn't that. And it didn't seem to have any neck. Yep. It, it, it was, yeah, they've got such massive trapezius and shoulder muscles that it comes up to their ear, basically. Yeah, you know? yeah, and if exactly. they want to hide their head, all they do is go like that, and it's just a mound. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And and we couldn't, you know, we were too far away to look at the facial features, but it was dark. The, the face the face was dark. And, and this is, you know, 4.35 o'clock in the afternoon. The sun was off to our our uh, west which would have been to our left and so uh it was somewhat dark down there um and so we couldn't see anything uh, regarding the facial features but it looked like it had a flat top on its head too that's <laughs> that was you know it was just like something would, had been you know crushed into its top of its head uh -huh. and you couldn't fake a human i mean you couldn't i don't know how a human could fake that and why you would want to out in the middle of nowhere. Yeah, why would you want through. to? In the middle yeah. of nowhere. There's no one else out there. Nobody there. There had been, when we first got there early in the morning, uh, on the on the good side or the easy side of, uh, of, the, of the lake, on the west side, there were some people over there fishing. But they had left, uh, you know, hours uh, before we did. And and there was absolutely no one out there. And, uh, and so it, I, I can't see anybody trying to prank us why would they do that and <laughs> yeah. why you know that so what we what i saw i'm convinced now it was a bigfoot and what color was he he was uh it was brown uh, almost like a bear i mean okay. brown hair the, the hair was long it was mm -hmm. long hair uh but the, but it didn't look anything like a bear standing up and no. when it when it walked away it was bipedal it never yeah. it didn't get down on all fours I've seen bears before. We've had a we had a, an encounter with a bear in 2005. My brother and I, we were camping and we went into a, a cave to spend the night. And this is up uh, north of Pagosa Springs, and a bear came out. No, <laughs> black bear came out, and you know we watched it run, and it you know it got away from us. It, when the bear didn't was, leave his no vacancy sign up or no, anything, no, no. it was as scared as uh, us oh, as if we were of them. Yeah. And it was a big one when I went. I mean, I seen bears, and I it wasn't. This thing was bipedal. I mean, its arms was extremely long, uh, maybe just above the knees. And uh, so I'm thoroughly convinced. You know, it's been twenty some years, uh, twenty three years, and I'm thoroughly convinced that it was a bigfoot. Now, I wish I could have. We could have had a, another sighting or take pictures or something, but you know, that's that's my story. Well, if you manage to get pictures, then you just get ridiculed by everybody that they're fake. Yeah. So it's maybe just, you know, <laughs> kind of irrelevant. It would be fun yeah. for yourself to go, we went back, we got pictures of them. <laughs> there they are. But most of the people are going to go, those pictures are way too good. Therefore, they're fake. Or they'll <laughs> go, or they're blurry, you know, so you can't tell exactly what that is, you know, so it's fake. I'll tell you one of the things we look for just in uh, random video when we're er in areas where we know they're around you look for the background shadows. The reason being that a shadow is not as dark as they are. You look for these particularly black, black shadows where there's no reason for it to be that dark. And then you pay close attention to those spots. And yeah, they are so black, they look like they're soaking up, uh, they're absorbing light. They're so black. Wow, wow. And you could tell yes. the difference between them and a standard... There's a pine tree. It's got overhanging branches. There's a shadow under it. They're like twice as dark as that shadow. It's pretty obvious when you start looking for it. You'd be like, regular shadow, regular, regular, regular. What's that one? <laughs> you know, it's twice as dark. If it's not the mouth of a cave, there's something sitting there that's jet black. That's amazing. Never thought of that. That's, that's yeah. Ooh, wow. 
that's one of the tricks we use to keep eye on uh, who's following us around. And we miss it most of the time, even though we, we know exactly what to look for. Uh, you know, seven times out of 10, I go back and look at my video and it's like, okay, I remember there was one over here. Did I get him on camera? Yeah. And then while I'm looking at the background video, it's like there's three or four more back there that I didn't notice. They were following me around. One, one of the things people ask uh, when we, I first told the story, especially to the, our local uh, Bigfoot guy here, was what did you did you detect a, 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 a strong or a pugent odor? And we didn't uh, from where we were at, but when we yeah. got down there, to where it had been, we did. And mm -hmm. so that's why my brother said it it's a dead animal that it was carrying because it kind of smelled. Uh, and that, it could be it, that he let out a stink cloud too, though, because when they get disturbed or uh, frustrated, annoyed, frightened, you know, it's just like when a human sweats, their armpit, armpit stink. We don't know if that's the mechanism, but they can actually make quite the putrid stench that's, you know, beyond ghastly in some cases. And we don't think it's probably them farting. <laughs> and this will linger in the area. And some of them just carry a stink around with them. But that's a separate issue. It's what their lack of hygiene or what they think smells good that they've just been rolling in recently. But generally, they don't have any smell. And if you think about it, it wouldn't make any sense for them to have much of a strong odor because they're omnivores. They have to hunt other animals. And if they right. stink really bad, they won't be able to sneak up on them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't have a, I mean, it wasn't an overwhelming order, but we could smell something. Yeah. And and as my brother said, and we didn't know about any of this. I mean, we were totally ignorant about Bigfoot back in that day. <laughs> and so he said, that's the dead animal he's carrying. That's what mm -hmm. we're smelling. A it rabbit been, or yeah. whatever it was. I actually but, lean yeah, toward your him. theory. The reason he was down there in the river is probably because he had some roots or something he was going to eat. And he was washing the dirt off of them. That's why he was kneeling there. And then he, of course, with their amazing senses, he didn't have to hear you. He went, somebody's behind me looking at me and got up and went, oh, there's humans up there. OK, time to leave. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, it's amazing because we were so far away. And and of course, then other people say, well, which way was the wind blowing? Well, we never we never even thought about that at the time. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I couldn't tell you which way the wind was blowing. And because uh, sound travels and, you know, the way I know that from from my military days. And uh, but. It turned and it stared at us. Yeah. This is what always, this is still amazes me. It didn't immediately run away. It just stared at us and it moved its kind of moved its head a little bit. Like it was looking at us. Now, maybe it had, maybe it has poor vision like bears. I don't know, but it, 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 it my no, brother. They have, for I, the most part, they have excellent vision. They have excellent vision. <laughs> my brother I said it was squinting, mm -hmm. uh, but I didn't see that. And, and so it kind of turned, but it didn't seem overly impressed with us, so to speak. Yeah. And then it turned around casually and walked across the stream. Now, at that particular point in Willow Creek, you can walk across and it's maybe a foot deep. It's not it's not very deep right in that area. Farther yeah. down it is, but right there. And he walked across. And that's when my brother said, let's go. Let's go. Let's try to get, get more information or go. I said, yeah, let's go. <laughs> and he was braver than I was. <laughs> but I said, are you OK? Let's go. And uh, but it was probably didn't want any anything to do with us. And no, classic sighting, though. And I can give you some uh, additional stories where similar things have happened. And, and this is almost to the point of disturbing, but I can understand how it happens. But I had somebody that was a big game hunter and they were looking for um, wild sheep. So you're way out there and distances are gigantic and you're looking for little teeny dots moving around on the opposite mountainside, maybe a couple miles away, right? And while he's glassing it over there, he sees a Bigfoot walking up this ridge and he hasn't got this thing on him for more than like three seconds and the Bigfoot stops and turns and looks directly at him. It wow. absolutely did not hear or smell him. It sensed he was looking at him. And even really good hunters can do that. They can tell when out, they're out in the woods if there's something watching them. And beyond that, even if it's like something that's indifferent or something that's going to kill them. So yeah. you better believe Bigfoot's got the same ability. So if you start staring directly at them for a few seconds, they get that feeling somebody's looking at me and they can tell where it's coming from. And I can't, you know, I, I can't even count how many times I've heard this sort of thing. So that's actually very common. 
No, they don't so, have to smell you or hear you. If you're staring at them, they could tell somebody's staring at them. So they are quite intelligent. Very. Yeah, they're just about as intelligent as we are, basically. In some ways, probably more so. As far as their wilderness craft and living in the woods, they know way more than we do about it. Oh, wow. Amazing. Amazing. Well, that's my story uh, about that. And uh, the other uh, story I have is about <clears throat> a little history. You know all about this. and I Yeah, didn't... this uh, most famous Bigfoot <laughs> video ever yeah. shot back in 1967. 67. October by uh, Roger Patterson and Bob Gimlin, <laughs> who I've actually met a few times. Well, um, about a year ago, less than a year ago, a good friend of mine approached me and said, um, have you heard of this Bigfoot film, Patterson Gimlin film? And I said, yeah, I, I you know, vaguely heard of it. I've seen it on TV and it's all over Facebook. You can, I mean, uh, YouTube, you can, you can look at it. Why, why? He said, uh, what do you know about it? And I said, well, you know, I was only, you know, I was real young back in those days. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But uh, I, I know about it. Uh, you know, well, why? What do you know? He said, well, I got the original one. of the, He says the original film. And I said, OK. I said, it's been on the Internet. And he said, but no, not this one. He said, I want you to look at it. I want you to see it. He said, what I want you to do first is watch one on YouTube. And of course, you know, you can find them on YouTube. And I watched the one on YouTube and there's so many frames and so long and uh after that he said i'm going to show you this one was there yes yes i was backing roger patterson up all the time uh, while well, he had the camera up working with it i was right in back of him it was a saturday sunshiny bright fall day october 20th uh, to be exact left camp uh, about uh 1 30 in the afternoon uh, a sunny real sunshine sunny sunny day and we got everything packed up in the little pack horse and ate lunch and everything. And we started, got started out. And of course, Roger was riding in front of me all this time. And he was filming uh, the trees, uh, the, the beautiful colors, the uh, changing fall colors that everything was changing. And uh, never even thinking that we'd ever run onto a Bigfoot because we were going to head way on back about 35, 40 miles farther back and stay the weekend. 
and uh, we were only, I say, about four miles from where our camp was, uh, just riding along the creek and lazily kind of rolling along there with a sunshiny afternoon, and all at once, boom, there's one standing across the creek. So things started happening dramatically fast. Oh my God, yes, I remember the feeling. It was just, yes, they really do exist. You know, because I was kind of down the middle of the road. I, uh, there were so many testimonials that Roger played to me about different folks that had seen them and, and witnessed uh, tree knocks and tree uh, bent limb, uh, limbs and stuff. And that, that, that I kind of, I was kind of on the, idea that yeah there probably is something that's why i went down to see these footprints that's why i did all the work that i did to get down there to see the footprints and then they were all disturbed and ruined and that's the other reason why we decided to stay and ride and uh, and look for more evidence is, is that that was the only reason and so to be able to run on to one it was like, oh, God, there he is one. And she's walking away. And I'm trying to hold my horse from and, and stay on my horse. And, of course, Roger's horse just went berserk. Well, mine did too, but I was able to stay on him because, uh, you know, I was a pretty good rider back and I was just... I was only 36 years old, so I was a pretty good rider, and um, I stayed on my horse, and Roger finally, uh, he didn't get actually dumped off his horse, but he got a little help getting off, and he grabbed the saddle bag cover, uh, one flap that he had it on there, and unflapped it and got the camera out and started running across the creek, uh, taking the film, the picture, and he he stumbled. It had a kind of a up a bank on the far side, and so Roger had his <coughs> had the camera up to his eye, of course, and he kind of stumbled and fell down on his elbows, and he wasn't really sure if he got sand or whatever in the camera, because this is all happening really really fast, and excited. I'll never forget that that few seconds that I did get to see her. It'll be with me the rest of my life. And so I feel like that I was pretty much, well, I won't say I was blessed, uh, really blessed, but however reason or why reason, uh, why the reason that I got to be the one that witnessed her that I'm still alive, makes me feel really good. And there's been so much question about, do you feel that, that, that there was a young one or, well, we never know because there were three different sizes of footprints and this was only about three miles from where the footprints were. And it, it, it indicated that there was a male, a female and a youth. So beings we only saw, well, I didn't, I didn't realize that was a female at the time I saw it. Uh, I didn't know the difference, but uh, things we saw, one, the possibility that there was the other two up in the woods somewhere around, and maybe that's why she walked away and, and did the things that she did. I'll call it she because we did find out later on when they figured, found out she had mammary glands and so forth that it was a female. And so... Uh, to make that kind of a little bit uh, plainer, uh, it was a, uh, it would be like uh, she might be doing something to detour us away from the other two, or she might be traveling to where they were, or it was so many ifs. 
Well, yeah, when I first saw the film footage, I thought, that's nothing. That, you know, guy, he, he never really got anything that was, that was good because I was looking at it through two blue eyes and Roger was with the camera and the film footage that he got was, well, I, I finally decided that it's pretty good. But the first time I saw it, I said, that's, that's nothing. That's nothing. I saw so much more uh, of everything, uh, of the muscle movement, and and um, and I was looking at it all the time. Roger had to relocate two or three different times to get a little closer, and uh, well, that's why I, uh, that's why I rode across the creek uh, to and took the rifle out of the scabbard just because he, he said, "Well, Bob, can you cover me while I go and get in another area?" Because he wasn't sure that 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 it was all alone either. He didn't know whether the other two, uh, because there was three different size footprints, whether the other two was there somewhere around. So anyway, it was, it, there was so much stuff that went on about that over the years and, and it settled down a whole lot uh, because um, people are seeing them now and witnessing them and witness what they do. And there's actually folks that claim they communicate with them. anybody that they exist at all. I said, I know they exist. And I say, you know, there's no question. They say, well, is there a little bit of question? Is there a question whether you could have been fooled? I said, no way. No way. Well, we were away. We were 36 miles back in the woods. And the closest thing to us was guys up on the side of the mountain, way up high, starting to build a road, a logging road back. And they were up, way on up on the side of the mountain uh, with a bulldozer and road graders and stuff. And I don't even know if they were even anybody up there on a Saturday. This was on a Saturday afternoon, October 20th, 1967. Okay, Roger Patterson, 1967 era of Sasquatch research. Okay, most of the guys back then, they used uh, hunting, stalking techniques like they were after a bear or something. They really didn't realize the intelligence of Sasquatch and their camouflage abilities. But with that said, um, they both knew and they bo both knew where the Sasquatch would be. They found and cast prints before and after their great footage of Sasquatch. Okay, Patty of uh, Patterson Sasquatch. Um, she was caught at the creek in morning footage uh, with when Bob and Roger rode up uh, that path, and she, her view was blocked by a large uh, root system of a down tree. 
she bolted across the open ground and we think that she was trying to protect her young in nearby in the scrub by trying to leave Roger and Bob away in a different direction. Patty is smaller than Paula. Um, they're both female Sasquatch and she's, as I mentioned before, is trying to lead Roger and Bob away. Now Paula, she purposely enters into the clearing to help a young juvie in that cedar uh, escape. So it climbs up her, she moves further left, hides in the bushes, does her little, does her little fade out thing, and Freeman eventually loses her in the background and starts panning around and she escapes left. Something also that gets left out of the breakdowns is that Patterson uh, and Gimlin uh, encounter lasted a lot longer than their footage. They just didn't know about it. Um, the Sasquatch were right there watching Patterson and Gimlin cast all Patty's prints and whatever the smaller prints they found in the area. Same goes for Freeman, except he knew they were there. They were screaming at him for two hours, and he had asked God if he could get out of here, that alive, they would leave these creatures alone. Now, with Patty, um, some speculation about this and some wild theories, um, but she appears to have a bullet grazing wound right there on her right thigh, which causes that hernia. So her group were being hunted, probably by the loggers, trying to scare them out of the area. Freeman Sasquatch, um, she uh, was, I guess, more or less used to Freeman being there, and she boldly walked and stepped out into the path, and he got that great footage of her after she was tree peeking. Okay, something I want to mention in wrapping up. Um, first of all, uh, where is the evidence from the 27-year gap between Patterson's and Freeman's footage. Uh, what did everybody do? Just decide that it was much easier to go straight to the studio or to make little mini series and search of kind of footage. I mean, that's fine for filmmakers, but where's the researcher's evidence from 1967 to 1994? I mean, uh, sure, it's tough going into the woods and finding and filming Sasquatch, especially in daylight which I do all the time. Uh, I do a little bit of night research. I don't really have the equipment, but I mean, uh, it seems to me that there's a lot of people who are standing on what everybody else has done. Uh, they're knowledgeable because of what field researchers have done before them. So now they uh, are great at talking about Bigfoot on TV and the radio. But if you were to go up to some of these real popular people and say, hey buddy, uh, hey, great speech. Uh, Where's your personal footage of Sasquatch since you know so much? I mean, um, not that, you know, you ha everybody needs to have footage, but if you're going to talk about how to find Bigfoot or what to do or what's Bigfoot thinking or all this shit, then where's your footage? Let's see it. I mean, if you're trying to pass yourself off as an authority, show me the money. And so he had a... Uh you know, movie projector, one of the old uh, 60 millimeter movie projectors, which I thought was really odd. And I said, you got to, you don't have it That's on. That's antique equipment, man. Yeah. Where'd you get that from? <laughs> you don't have this on uh, uh, a DVD? And he said, no, 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 this is a regular film. So anyways, I watched it. And it's the exact same. Everything's the same up to the end. There's some commotion with a camera. Patterson kind of moved the moved the, the camera around and then he aimed at a particular place in the woods and there's a little Bigfoot. He start, it started running and it stopped and it's moving as if to go after the one that passed in his, the film, the mother, uh, right. we would suspect. Patty as they call her. Yeah, and so um, I said, oh my God, that's not in a one, on the, I said, he said, no, this is, this is the one. And then he tells me a story about Patterson uh, going and getting this film developed and making so many copies at a, at a studio. And I think it was, uh, I think it was Redmond, California. Or, and, and then he, uh, he gave one to a, to his friend and he, he was going to give one to Gimlin, but 
uh, I guess people realize that Patterson and Gimlin weren't friends. They, they, they feuded uh, during that time. And then, of course, Patterson died in 1970. So the family hired uh, a man by the name of Bruce Maccabee. Now, anybody that that has followed the UFO phenomena for many years r- realizes the name uh, of Bruce Maccabee. He's the uh, Navy uh, optical physicist who analyzed UFO films. And he's prominently mentioned in the UFO community. But uh, Bruce did some work for the Patterson family. Uh, and, after, and he was promised money. But after the work was done, the family couldn't pay him, but, but they, they gave him this film in a canister, original canister, and said, this will be my payment. It's going to be worth a lot of money down the road. So Bruce said, okay, warm-hearted Bruce, took it back, kept it for some time, looked at it, compared it to the original, the one on the internet, and realized, oh my God, there's a little one, there's a little Bigfoot in this one. This, mm-hmm. this, this is real. So now, during the last uh, you know, seven months, they've been trying to sell the film. And um, it's been analyzed by some people, uh, they're, tr- they're, they're, they're tr- experts, uh, all within the movie industry. Because the movie, they, they're trying to sell it to the movie industry. So the movie industry looked at the original film they had. So yeah, it's you know error in the '60s. It uh, doesn't seem to be. It's not fake. There's there's nothing um, spliced together or anything like that. So that's where that's where we are now. They're still trying to sell it, <clears throat> and I think uh, you know for the right price. They originally wanted a lot of money for it. And I, I said, I don't think you're ever going to get that. Although there, there are some people that were offering them a lot of money, uh, not what they wanted. But um, so there are some people out there that 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 are going to go look at it again and, and see if they would would sell it. But the people that are doing that now aren't the right people. They're they're the the movie industry. There's one person within the wrestling industry, the WWE or WWF or whatever it is. I'm, I don't follow wrestling. Who wants to get it and play it right before uh, wrestling events? They, they they don't want it for the right reason. No. And so uh, that's my uh, that's my story about the Patterson Gimlin film and the uh, extra uh, film uh, that was at the end of that reel. So the big takeaway on this: not only is there additional few seconds of video that nobody in the public has seen. That shows a squatchlet, little baby Bigfoot running around. Right. But you've actually seen this with your naked eyes. You oh, can I've verify yeah. this is real. Well, I've seen it. You know, I've, I've, I've seen it with my naked eye. It's, it's real. It's absolutely real. There's, there, you know, <clears throat> if, you, if you compare it, and we did this, me and this other guy that went there, we were watching, we, we had, a, we had the, the YouTube on, we had it on a big screen. And we had a projector and we tried to sync it so it was running at the exact same speed or same, same time. Right. And we were, you know, within a millisecond uh, of having both run together. And we watched it. And at the end of the Internet film, there's a commotion. Patterson moves the camera around and then he aims it uh, at one particular area. Everything's exact same in the original film and the internet's the film, except for that last seven or eight seconds. Because in the one on the internet, it, it doesn't show, it stops. Yeah. Whereas the original film continues on. Now, there's a, you mentioned this earlier when we were talking off camera. There's another guy that looked at it uh, from the motion in, in industry. Uh, he's an expert in the History Channel. He says, I think there's another Bigfoot behind that little one. Mm-hmm. There's shadowing. You can't, you can see shadows. You can't actually see a Bigfoot, but you can see shadows. There's yeah. nothing around there would have caused shadowing. The little yeah. guy, the little one is running or moving. And there's behind that, there's, he says there's another one. 
Now, you mm-hmm. mentioned that you think there was or you saw that there was another one, too. Actually, I have uh, one of my friends who's uh, another Bigfoot researcher up in uh, northeast Ontario, Canada, Blaine Tyler, did a breakdown on the original Patterson uh, Gimlin film. And this guy goes out in the field and films him, so he knows what to look for. And he looked at that video and went, there's one standing back there and there's one standing over there. And neither one of them moves appreciably, so you don't have that to draw from. But what you do have to draw from is shape, size, and that there's nothing there to make that shadow. Ah. <laughs> Wow. So he knows there, according to him, there's at least two more adults in the scene where she's walking away. There's one over on the right hand side and there's another one further back. So I don't know which direction Patterson went after he was trying to stabilize the camera right. again to where the little one was, but it probably wasn't that far away from his field of view because he noticed it moving. Right. Yeah. And then, and, and, and uh, as I was doing research, I met a guy. Um, on the internet, he, he sent me an email. Uh, this is when we were trying to, I was trying to broker a deal. And he sent me a, a long email about uh, what happened uh, 12 days prior to the Gimlin Patterson film. And that there were these four ranchers or four game hunters that came in there and, and uh, were looking for, I don't know if they were looking to hunt elk or whatever but they apparently shot one but uh, that could be just a legend that could be actual fact yeah hard to tell the body never showed up right and there's another alternate version of that too that the uh since they were putting in a logging road there that they'd been getting messed with by the bigfoot that didn't like them putting in logging road and so they had actually hired a goon squad to come down from canada to chase them off and shortly before the Patterson Gimlin film had been filmed, that there actually had been one or more of them shot. And then they figured it was all over with and they were gone. And next thing you know, Bob Titmus calls them and says, hey, we got Bigfoot tracks down here. Come down and film them. And they come back down and then they're like, oh, wait, they're still around here. We didn't get rid of them. Oh, damn it. These guys are down here trying to film them now. <laughs> Oh, wow. So and, know, the, uh, one of the things they point to with that is if you look at the Patterson Gimlin film and MK Davis has pointed this out several times and others, there's a big hematoma on the the right leg of Patty, which they think could be, you know, from being shot. Right. Yeah. 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 I heard that, too. Uh, now, this guy that talked to me and he's an he's an old guy. I mean, I mean, you know, I'm in my 60s, so I'm not say old, old, but he's old. He's probably 80. Um he told me about an incident happened in Canada. You probably know about it in a place called Anheim, 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 A N N, in British Columbia, where uh, it's a there was a nature trail, and there was a family from Victoria, Canada, uh, B C, walking on this nature trail, and a and a Bigfoot came and confronted them, chasing them off the trail. They didn't harm the the people. But it was making sounds and chasing them off. Did you hear ever hear about that case? No, no, I hadn't heard of that specific one. This is fairly commonplace where if they don't like you in an area and they really, really want you to go, they'll make a bluff charge and a display like that to try and get you to leave. If they're not in a big hurry, they'll just sit there and throw acorns at you, which will then turn to rocks. <laughs> which will then turn to bigger rocks, which will eventually turn to boulders landing right next to you. Hopefully you're getting the hint. At that point, if it doesn't work, the trees start shaking. There's roaring, things like that. Uh, it's really rare that you get one that just out of the blue attacks somebody. They'll either try and avoid you or else they, you know, if they want you to leave, they'll give more than subtle hints generally. <laughs> yeah. You're not where you should be and you should probably get yeah. out of there. Anybody with any common sense would run. <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. You know, e- e- even in the absence of knowing anything about them, weird things are happening. You're hearing strange yeah. noises. There's something big moving around over there. And again, I mentioned that to you on the fo- uh, with you on the phone. If you're yeah. out in the woods somewhere and you can hear them walking around and they're not growling at you or anything like that, well, you don't really need to be worried because they're letting you hear them walk around they want you to know they're there. It's when you don't hear them walking around and everything goes completely silent and they're sneaking up on you for some reason. That's when you should be worried. And I mean, everything goes silent. Bugs stop buzzing everything. Dead still. That only happens when big predators are around. 
So if they're in big predator mode, then you might be in the wrong place and it might be a good time to leave. Well, you know, I, after the, my, my experience in uh, uh, 1999, um, never, never had another experience of seeing one. But um, when we were backpacking uh, for the three or four days that we would do, uh, do that in the summer uh, in Colorado, there were times when we heard things. Uh, we didn't see anything. We just heard things. Um, uh, we had uh, we were camping in a place really remote, uh, high on a mountain. Um, in a, in a uh, uh, we were between Pagosa Springs uh, up towards Wolf Creek Pass, if you know where that is. And uh -huh. anyways, we we were <clears throat> we camped in a nice area. It was raining. We could look down in this little valley. And there were elk bedded down there. Of course, this is summertime. And so we we made our meal. It was raining. We were just shooting a bull, my brother and I. He tells me stories. He was a, He's a Vietnam vet. And he would tell me stories about Vietnam. And all of a sudden, we start hearing things. And my brother says, the, elk, the elk's up. The elks are moving, he thinks. I said, no, they bed down at night. They, they ain't going to. I mean, I elk hunted for years. I mean, they're gonna, yeah, they, unless they got something pushing them around. Exactly. At night. exactly. And you know what? This is almost like a, a, a truism in Colorado. The Bigfoot researchers all know this. If you want to figure out where the Bigfoot are, go to where the elk are because they follow the elk around all the time. Yep. And so we we heard this and we heard it, it and there was a lot of noise at first and then it became real silent, like you said. So we thought, well, it, it's, it's, you know, maybe it's a bear or something. We didn't think much of it. But as it got darker, my brother went over and looked down in the meadow, and the elk were all gone. Oh. Now this is this is a bedding, you know. You, I'm sure you're, uh, you've hunted elk before. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah, and, and you know that where they bed down, and the harem is, they, you know, they're going to do that for the night, and they were all gone. And I said, oh. my God, and I said, my brother, I said, you think there's a Bigfoot chasing them? He goes, well, you know, never saw any. I said, but we heard something, and then it became silent, and then we heard the elk leave. The, the, <laughs> the commotion we heard later was that the elk was leaving. Yeah. So, and we never saw anything. But, you know, that, we, I thought about that and saying, I bet you, I bet you they were tracking those elk. They could have been. Because that's, that's a big meal for them. Yeah, and the other thing is, if they could drive them out of that open meadow into the woods, they can have other ones sitting on the far side to grab the yep. little ones when they come through in yep. the dark and can't see what they're doing. Yep, yep, yep. Makes for so, easy hunting. They're smart. They <laughs> hunt in groups. I was camped out on the mountain about uh, two miles away from here, and I had found an area where there was this big thicket of pine trees about 15 feet tall, and it was like a labyrinth in there. And there were game trails that went in there all over the place. And I started thinking about it, and I went, this is a perfect kill zone right in here. You can't run in a straight line. It's really close. Everything zigzags around. And all the deer have to go through this thicket to get further down the mountain. And there's a game trail that's going into it. Okay. Wow. So I camped about 150 yards from there. And about three, three nights a week, I would hear them getting into position. Where one of them that was sitting in that thicket would make a single wood knock. And then another one about 100 feet or so up the trail would whoop or something that, like that back to him to let him know he was in position. And what they're doing is the one up the trail is waiting for a deer or something to come walking down it. He spooks a deer and chases it into the thicket, and the one in the thicket just reaches out and grabs it. Oh, so they are intelligent. Oh, they're very, hunt. very smart. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they don't hunt. They don't hunt hard. They hunt smart. <laughs> we found a lot of places like that where there's this really odd brush pile right next to a deer trail and you start looking closer at it and you go wait a minute that couldn't have got there naturally what's going on here and you walk around the far side of it well it's a blind there's a oh. bigfoot trail that comes down the hill to where that blind is and then goes up the hill away from it never directly intersects the deer trail gets about five feet from it so they can get to that blind without leaving their scent on the trail and then when the deer go past it they just reach out and grab them they don't run around chase deer. They just sit there and ambush them. <laughs> if you're smart, you don't have to. Yeah? Well, you exactly. To see? That's why they got so much time to throw rocks at humans, because they probably only spend like two, three hours a day hunting and grubbing for food. And the rest of the time they can spend messing with humans and throwing rocks at us. And... 
<laughs> well, that's my, uh, that's my, uh, I do have one other, just a relationship of a UFO to a Bigfoot story uh, that happened in uh, Nevada some years ago. And this is told to us. I didn't have any firsthand experience, but a, uh, one of our, you field remember what part of Nevada? Yeah. Up near Eli. Okay. Yeah. Um, a, a family was camping, uh, not at a, a regular campsite. It was a unincorporated campsite and it was a, a man, woman and, and, and two older ch children. I think the, the boy was like 15. Uh, the daughter was 12 and they were, uh, Camping, it was uh, late July, uh, 78, 79 time frame, and they saw an object fly over. And uh, the father said, well, looks like a helicopter is going to land. And so this thing landed pretty close to them in a clearing on, a, on the other side of this little small lake that they were camping next to. And um, but when the father went out to look, he said, oh my God, that's not a helicopter. It's a flying saucer. So they all went out, look, the mother had a camera. She had a Polaroid, the old Polaroid. And she went and, and took, I think there was eight pictures in a cartridge and she took all eight pictures of it. But she was so far away that, although, you know, there is a, we had the uh, US intelligence took the pictures. So uh, it just stayed there on the ground for, for, for a while. And they decided to just go back to camp. They got scared. They didn't know really what to do. In fact, they went to back to camp and they got in their vehicle. Yeah, I don't blame them. Rather than, than camping out in the tents. And so they got in their vehicle and the, bo the father said, you know, I got to go take a, I got to go relieve myself. And he got out and he walked over to a tree and about that time, as he walked to the tree and started to do his business, he looked up and, and according to his story, uh, he was about five feet away from this hairy monster. Oh, God. And, of course, the description of what he looked at was that of a Bigfoot. Not, mm -hmm. not a human, but a Bigfoot. And it just stared at him. He stared. At, he backed away and never moved towards him. It just stayed there and stared at him. He got back, got in the vehicle, and then they drove off, leaving their camp. Uh, so that's one of a, a several connections I have between. Now, there may be no connections. Maybe that flying saucer with the ETs in it had nothing to do with this uh, Bigfoot, or maybe there's some kind of a connection there. That's That was a very, very interesting sighting. I actually had... The opportunity of sp speaking to the woman uh, years later at a UFO convention. Her husband had, had since died, and and she t she told a story to us uh, to a room full of the real hardened guys like uh, Wendell Stevens, who the UFO people would know who he is, and uh, Robert Dean and myself. Uh, and and she related that to us, and this is you know twenty some years later, as if she was still there. And uh, she told this story. And, uh, of course, she's relating what her husband told her. She never saw anything. But she said he was never the same. He said that this monster was looking at him. He connected the monster to the UFO. Right. The flying saucer. Um, and, and, and you know, our investigators thought, eh, maybe or maybe it was just coincidence that Bigfoot was there, too. And maybe that Bigfoot was scared of the ETs too. I don't, you know, we, you know, think about no. all sorts of scenarios, uh, but it never, it never threatened him. It never came after him. Uh, they just, uh, he said he was maybe five feet from it and they locked eyes and the Bigfoot never moved. And of course he was backing up when he saw <laughs> it. Yeah. I can imagine how scared somebody yeah. would be <laughs> yeah, at night when something like that happened. So that's my, uh, uh, that it. happened to one of my friends that was on the show. He was he does Bigfoot research and he was sleeping in his car. And in the middle of the night, his eyeballs were floating. He had to get up and relieve himself. So you know how far you go. You open the door of the car and take like three steps, right? Yeah. <laughs> and he's standing there doing his business and he's looking at the ground. There's a little bit of moonlight and there's a clamshell there. And he's like, 
what the hell is a clamshell doing here in Kentucky? That doesn't make any sense. And he realizes there's more smaller clamshells next to it. And then he realizes those are toenails. He's looking at the foot of a Bigfoot that's standing like literally right next to him, watching him pee, at which point he falls over backwards, hits his head on the car. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> Holy cow. Yeah, luckily I had pretty good relations with the ones in that area, and uh, they probably thought it was hilarious or whatever. But you know, this is this is the only report I've heard of them doing that. Uh, Kelly Shaw from Rocky Mountain Sasquatch, him and his uh, a research assistant and girlfriend Jenny both had to stop. They had to pull off to the side of the road, relieve themselves. And Jenny was just finishing up; he was already done. He looks in the rear view, and there's somebody back there watching him. And then he realizes that's not a person. So he grabs his camera, jumps up, and runs after him. There's a big one oh standing gosh. there watching. Oh. <laughs> oh my gosh! So yes, they are very observant. Uh, as far as the uh, the Bigfoot and UFO thing goes, you know, you do occasionally hear stories of that where they're sighted in the same place at the same time. There's one incident where people had taken a shot at two of them, a large one and a smaller one, and they had run away into a copse of woods, which. Pro uh, promptly uh, barfed out a UFO out of the top of it. So, you know, did wow. they go get out the UFO or what was going on there? And then you hear other stories where you're in an area where you know they're around, they're there all the time. And there's not usually any other activity there and, and a, a UFO will show up, at which point do they seem to run for the hills. They're like out of there. So wow. it's it's hard to tell. Yeah. What the connection is, you know, what we've been able to get from psychics that communicate with them is that apparently it's mostly the Zetas that are messing with them and they can't stand the Zetas. So oh. it, it sounds like it's them avoiding the UFOs most of the time. That makes sense. Yeah. For whatever reason, I don't understand what the Zetas want to mess with them for. It sounds like that they're trying to control them for some reason, use them for spies, whatever, but they're not down with it. And so... Uh, you know, if they get a chance, they'll stomp them. <laughs> they will squish them. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Probably well, doesn't that's make for the friendliest of relations. But yeah, it was great having you on the show here. If yeah. at some point you have uh, more Bigfoot and UFO reports that you want to uh, come on the show and talk about that, you know, we, we know that there's a definite connection there, at least with, and we're assuming there's more than one alien race interacting with our planet. But it seems to be predominantly the problem is between them and the Zetas. And it doesn't seem like the other alien races have much of any interest or anything to do with them, really. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, there's a, there's a lot to that. And there's a, you know, there's, you know, there's a lot of stories that we hear from people at UFO conventions that uh, probably connects them. For instance, real quickly, this uh, Air Force security guard at a nuclear weapons facility in Maine years ago um, saw a, a UFO flying and he didn't actually see it land, but it was, he figured that it landed north of, uh, it was Loring Air Force Base. And uh, shortly afterwards, the one of the fence alarms went off and uh, him and another uh, security guard went to the, went to that location where to check it out. And they, they, enc they encountered a, a Bigfoot. And now this guy, he's spoken, he's this, uh, he, he was retired from the Air Force and he's, he's spoken, uh, I think twice at UFO conventions about this. And he's thoroughly convinced that that you, that Bigfoot came out of that UFO. And that, that was, an, that's, and there's a lot more to that because there's other people that saw it too, not just. Wow. Them. That's even better. You got multiple yeah. eyewitnesses. Yeah, there, but... there's, there, yeah. There was a story that leaked its way into the um, the YouTube sphere here recently. I think uh, it was on how to hunt. Somebody sent their story and he read it. And it was supposedly uh, a team over in Afghanistan that was fighting with the Taliban. And in the middle of the firefight, the Taliban got attacked by dogmen. And they didn't know what the hell to do with that. And then it got even worse. And, and uh, UFOs showed up and dropped off some Bigfoot that started stomping all the dogmen. And, uh, you know, of course, they just quit doing anything and just sat there and watched it like, what the hell are we looking at here? You know? Well, you know, there's stories, uh, although my brother never encountered anything, but there's Vietnam vets that tell stories about uh, Bigfoot or, or uh, ape creatures. Rock apes. Yep. Rock apes. The Batutut. That, 
I just yeah. brought that up on Spaced Out Radio last week. I was talking about some of the reports I had gotten from Vietnam vets of running into those things in the jungle over yep. there. And wow, scary stories. I mean, the one oh, guy, yes. he was a perimeter sniper. They had a big land uh, LZ there, so they had blown away all of the shrubbery and trees for a long distance around it. But every night, the Viet Cong snipers would try and sneak up close enough to shoot random people. So they had to have counter snipers out there in the devastated zone to keep an eye for him. And this one guy said multiple times he could hear these guys creeping around, getting closer to him, and all of a sudden one of them would scream and he'd hear this roar, and then it'd be silent. And the first couple times he thought tigers were getting him. Oh, and then wow. I think it was like the third time he actually saw what got him and it wasn't a tiger. <laughs> and then he wanted to stay closer to the base when he was out in the devastated zone at night counter sniping because he knew what was out there laying in wait for those guys to crawl up too close. Oh, my God. Rock apes. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's, that's what that's what they called them. Yeah. The rock apes were rock getting apes. them. And then that was because of the area they were in. Uh, you know how warfare is. You've got to take all the available ground just to, if nothing else, deny it to the enemy. Yeah. So you have to take these areas that aren't even really populated. There's nobody there. Well, there was somebody there. And they weren't <laughs> happy about either they side being about. there in their territory. <laughs> oh, wow. That's interesting. Well, I enjoy being on your show, Duke, and I'd certainly uh, uh, well, could, could come back and tell you some other stories. But uh, those two there are... Um, are, are interesting, fascinating to me, and um, I hope that the uh, the Patterson Gimlin film can sh- can find a buyer that will uh, market it in, a, in in the proper way. I agree with you. That's some great news. So if they're interested in buying the film, they can contact you to get in hold of, of the uh, yes. seller. Then, right? Yes. Yeah, I can get. I can. Yeah, and my email is uh, Rick R I C K. Doty, D-O-T-Y, 166 at msn.com. There you go. So they get a hold of you. Just quick before you go, as long as you're involved in doing all this other research for the Air Force and whatnot when you're doing your job there, and I'm assuming mostly aerial phenomenon, did you run into much of anything cryptid-wise? Um, encrypted or no, no, mean? cryptids, Bigfoot, Dogman, Giants, things like that. Oh, oh, um, yeah, um, but we equated that, the the stories or the incidents that uh, involved uh, ETs that were, um, uh, that we know, we knew of. Back in those days, back in, in the uh, late 70s and 80s, we, the United States government, I was briefed into the program. And I knew we knew of five different races of ETs that have been visiting Earth. And some of them uh, were hideous looking, uh, praying mantis types. Mm -hmm. Uh, They were shape shifters. Some of them could change uh, appearances. Uh, So we we knew of those. Um, But but uh, as far as and then since then, there are probably. 20 or 30 other races that uh, that have been, that have we I wasn't fully briefed into the program back in those days. I knew of five races. Right. But as I ended towards the end of my intelligence career, I went to work for uh, Dr. Hal Putoff at the Institute for Advanced Studies. And we did classified work for DARPA. And uh, we learned that the five that we that I knew of had risen to 30. <laughs> so there's. <laughs> More and more Flash races. Flash. Now we don't know if there were all one, or if one particular uh, species of of ETs could change appearances, or had clones. Uh, that yeah, were that's working a problem. With. If you got shapeshifters, you don't know if it's just making itself look different, or if it actually is a different species. But it seems like there's enough, at least, anecdotal evidence coming in that at least some of these species are making variant versions of themselves for, you know, certain utilitarian purposes. So they've got these little subspecies that they're creating for right. whatever they want them to be used for, you know. Well, you got to understand that most, well, in order to come here from any planet, they would have to be uh, thousands of years more advanced in technology than, our, and, than us. And one of the things that, that the lay people don't understand is aliens are from another planet. 
They ha they're non another civilization, another science, uh, another biology. They don't think the way we do. Their brains are different than ours. So we can't really get inside their brains and try to figure out what they're doing or why they're doing it, nor can we get in, into their science. Now, yeah. they may, may be able to uh, create robots that are um, humanoid in all appearances or in, in a android uh, 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 type of, of, of creature. Uh, and why they're making these, uh, maybe they're doing, maybe those uh, creatures are doing the recon or the dirty work for the actual uh, species that uh -huh. are visiting. So it's difficult for us uh, to understand the ETs. And, yeah, and this... another thing that people don't realize, and I get this all the time, is, well, why don't they, you know, why don't they, you know, this ET and, and that ET, why are they so different? Well, they come from st different star systems, different planets. Some of them don't even breathe our atmosphere. Right. Uh, we 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 uh, captured, and I, I'm not giving away any secrets. We have captured some, and we had to build special facilities, Area 51, for these ones because they didn't breathe our atmosphere. Or you're referencing the the one Eben that survived the crash back in the what, like that, 40s. Yeah. Yeah, the, the Eva one that survived the crash was in captivity from 1947 and 1952. He oh. did not, he, we had to put a, our oxygen uh, atmosphere was too much for him. We had, he had to uh, use a depressor, an O2 depressor, uh, because he, he was getting too much oxygen and it was harmful to his body. And, but there, there's other creatures that we have captured that, number one, they can feed themselves. They create food within their bodies that feeds themselves. Wow. Uh, they have to. They have to breathe uh, a little bit of methane or, or or some other gas because that's what what is present on their planet. So, aliens are ex totally different from us humans. <laughs> so, uh, and a lot of people don't realize that. They think they're you know they can just uh, they watch X Files and you know ETs are the same as humans. Uh, now, yeah. maybe ETs can create something similar to a human, and I wouldn't doubt that that's been done. It might be good for interfacing if they're not doing it with androids and they do it with something biological, make something that looks more similar to us so we're not instantly terrified and pooping our pants when we see it and exactly. more prone to actually interact with it in a normal way. Exactly, exactly, exactly. Stuff. Well, I'll tell you what, Richard, like uh, you said, uh, we're about at the top of the hour here. Thanks for filling up a very fascinating hour and giving us some more background on that missing Patterson Gimlin film. I hope that somebody steps up and buys it so we can all take a look at it at some point. And I would love to have you back on the show again at some point if you want to talk about more of the alien races and possible weird connections between sightings of cryptid creatures and UFOs and things like that it would make for an awesome, fun show. OK, we'll schedule that. I'll be back. All right. Sounds like a plan. Well, thanks very much for being here. And everybody else out there in listener land, you know what the drill is. Do not punt the puck, would you? Don't poke dog man with a stick. Don't flip off the mountain giant. Do not get probed by an alien. And whatever you do, don't hug the Wookiees. Good night, everybody.